When it comes to some pretty complicated ethical issues, the morality of war, the appropriateness of capital punishment and abortion, how do we navigate them as followers of Jesus? Well, we're talking about it today. My name is Emily and I'm the pastor of Epic Online and welcome to Epic Everywhere, practical teaching to help you grow in your faith no matter where you are on your spiritual journey. And a special welcome to anyone who's hanging out with us for the first time. Welcome! It's a big deal that you're hanging out with us today and to thank you for being here, we've got a free gift that we want to hook you up with. So we'll tell you how to snag yours and how to get connected around here in just a moment. Well, today we're finishing up a series that we've been in called Tough Talks, Conversations Worth Having. It's been full of hard conversations, but ones that have been really important for me personally, they've continued to deepen my faith and I hope they have yours as well. So we'll wrap that series up today. And just a heads up to parents, if you happen to have little ears in the room, today's content is designed for adults, so just an FYI on that. Well, whether you're hanging out with us today for the first time or you've been part of Epic for a while, something that we want for everyone here is to get connected. It's really a vital part of our faith and let's face it, as human beings, it just feels good to know others and to be known ourselves. So every time that you join us for church, we invite you to text in. To text in today, you can scan the QR code on the screen or you can text to 215-999-8575. You can text the word here. When you text in then, it goes ahead and marks that you were here with us today and it also gives you access to the Hub. The Hub is something that we created so you can have everything that you need in one spot. You'll see at the top of the Hub, there's a spot where you can share a prayer request. Each week, we actually get the opportunity to pray over each and every person who drops a prayer request. So let us know how we can pray for you today. You'll also see a spot on the Hub where you can give. We have a vision to see every person in the city follow Jesus. That's really what our name EPIC stands for because Jesus is the only one with the power to change the human heart. We want that for everyone because every person matters. So when you give, you're not just honoring God with your finances, you're fueling our mission to reach every person in the city. So I wanna invite you to give today. Again, you can do that right on the hub. And for any of you who are new, when you text in for the first time, we wanna go ahead and mail you a free t-shirt. Let's go. Just to say thanks for being here. And guess what the t-shirt says? Every person in the city. So text in and get your tea and rep Epic in your neighborhood today. Well, for some of you, you're mourning the end of summer. The idea of not being down the shore, it's absolutely devastating. For others of you, you're already consuming your pumpkin spice lattes, you've got your hoodies on deck, and you cannot wait for fall to arrive. And I gotta admit, I'm definitely on that same boat. Fall happens to be my most favorite time of the year. And not just because I love me some hoodie weather, it's also because we have a ton of great things going down as a church. Like what, you ask? Well, next Sunday, signups open for our fall group semester. And then in two weeks, we get to start a new series called Work Flow. It's all about how our faith intersects with the work that we do and how we do it. That whole series is gonna really be an amazing opportunity for us to invite our coworkers to church. Let's face it, we spend more time with our coworkers than we do our own families in some cases. So invite them to join you so that you guys can get better together. The content is gonna be meaningful and encouraging and we hope to see you there. And in the coming weeks, we'll be talking more about some other good things to come in the fall, good things ahead. Well, speaking of good things ahead, the time has come for today's message, so let's get to it. Hey, my name is Jake. I'm the pastor at Epic Roxboro, and today we are in our fourth and final week of our Tough Talk series. Uh, if you've been here for the other weeks in our series, uh, let me just say congratulations on making it through some really difficult topics. Uh, they've probably been uncomfortable and challenging at times. I'm 
pretty sure that we haven't always used the perfect words or covered all of the perfect content. Uh, but even if that's the case, like our prayer and our hope is that these discussions has helped you really think about some difficult issues from a biblical perspective. And for followers of Jesus, that really needs to be our starting point. Uh, although it doesn't always provide uh, neat and tidy answers whenever we look at scripture, at least make sure that we get off on the right foot. And that's important. Well, before we jump into this week's talk, which is about issues related to the value of human life, I want to share something that someone told me a number of years ago that's been really helpful for me when I interact with people with different opinions. And that's this. Everything that people do makes sense to them. Now, this is a super simple statement, maybe even insultingly simple. Uh, but when we remind ourselves of this truth, it can help us change our disposition from anger to curiosity. When someone does something or has a belief that you think no rational person could do or have, instead of automatically labeling them as an idiot, ask yourself, and then maybe them, how did you arrive at this conclusion? Because somehow or another, they've concluded their action or belief was reasonable. It might be because of different set of values. It might be because of uh, incomplete or inaccurate information. Uh, and sometimes it actually be because they don't think rationally. Uh, or, and I know this is always our last potential option, we might actually be wrong. Tough to believe, but I know. Uh, but before we can just jump to the conclusion that anyone who disagrees with us is irrational, let's first try and understand their perspective because everything that people do makes sense to them. Well, for example, I live in Roxborough and every time I drive down Henry Avenue or right around Walnut Lane, uh, I see a sizable line outside of Del Sandro Steaks. Uh, rain or shine, there are always people there waiting for their cheesesteaks. Now, for those of us from Philly know that uh, we have a variety of options when it comes to grabbing a steak sandwich, and, and some of us are pretty passionate about which one is the best. Uh, Del Sandro's is a popular pick. After all, it is Jimmy Kimmel's favorite. Uh, but right across the street is another uh, option, and that is Chubby's, which uh, actually Charles Barkley frequents. Uh, now, I know that listening to this talk, there are people who would really vigorously argue for both of those options, and neither of them are irrational cheesesteak connoisseurs. They just have different things they value and possibly incomplete or inaccurate information. For example, some people prefer their cheese steaks uh, with the steak chopped up a little smaller. Others prefer like little bigger pieces of steak. Their preferences on seasoning, their preferences on how the onions are cut. Uh, these are differences in their values and, and how they define the optimal cheese steak. Now, someone might be at a party and they have a Del Sandra's steak and they decide they'd definitely go there if they have the opportunity. But they might have wrong or incomplete information. In their minds, they might be picturing going into Del Sandro's, sitting down, having a cheesesteak and some fries. But when they arrive at Del Sandro's, they realize that they don't sell fries. And uh, they can't sit down inside. And they only take cash. They don't take cards. And all of a sudden, that person can't imagine why someone would stand outside in the rain for that option. Because now they have more complete information. At the same time, someone might drive by Del Sanders and see this big line outside and think, man, I'd much rather eat at Chubby's, go inside, sit down in the air conditioning, get some fries. Those guys are crazy. But then they actually try a Del Sanders cheesesteak and they fall in love. And they decide it's definitely worth any inconvenience because now they have more complete information. It's a pretty inconsequential example, but it makes the point that people often arrive at different conclusions simply because they're operating from a different set of values or because they have incomplete or incorrect information. That's why our views and perspectives change over time because our, um, our values and the information that we have, our experience, they morph over time. I can definitely say that my views have shifted over the years on some things. Some things I'm, I'm more clear on, uh, some things I'm just not as certain about. We're all a work in progress. So as we engage around these topics related to the value of life, let's try to be aware of the values that have shaped the different perspectives we've taken up to this point and the information we've used to reach our conclusions. Now, as we've done in the previous weeks of this series, uh, we're going to be using scripture as the guide for our worldview and for the basis of our values. That said, I realize and I'm so grateful that we have people with us who who aren't sure they align with a biblical perspective, or are pretty sure that they don't. If that's you, uh, thanks so much for joining us. And, and I just want to say how much I admire your courage and your intellectual curiosity to listen to a perspective that would be easy for you to dismiss without consideration. I really hope that what you hear is helpful for you as you formulate your beliefs 
around these difficult topics. Okay, so for Christians, one of the foundational principles in Scripture that is central to this discussion is that humans have unique value because we are created in the image of God. They're created to reflect Him and His character. Puppies and ponies and porcupines all have value. Uh, but Scripture teaches that God has set humans apart from the rest of creation. We see this in the very first chapter of the Bible, which describes uh, the creation. After God has created the earth and the moon and the stars, he creates plants and animals. He then concludes by creating the prize of his creation. Let's read this. It says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So only humans have been created in the image of God, which means in simplest terms that we are created to reflect what God is like because of our relationship with him. We have a unique capacity to exhibit the qualities of God that other creatures don't have. This idea that humans are made in the image of God is super important for Christians. It establishes not only our value, but also our purpose. We were created so that we would know and reflect what God is like. And it's this intrinsic value ascribed by God that informs our basis for protecting human life. To take an innocent life is an egregious thing. In Genesis chapter 9, God is giving instructions to Noah, and he includes some pretty strong language. He says, And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal, and from each Human being, too, I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God, God has made mankind. God couldn't be more clear. All human life has value, immense value, because we have been made in the image of God. It's not because of other characteristics that we have or because of certain things that we've accomplished. We all have inherent value as humans from God simply because he made us in his image. Whether or not we believe this has huge practical implications because those who believe that we came about through random chance and therefore have no intrinsic value, well, they need to come with an alternative reason to give value to human beings. This is sometimes called the performance view where cognitive function like self-awareness or intellect or some other baseline ability uh, is a requirement for a person to have value. I mean, this is such a slippery slope. Uh, for example, if, if you chose some um, intellectual level to provide value to a person, then if you have a handicapped person and there's an animal that has more intellectual ability, then you'd have to value that animal more than the human. Or even among humans, if there's one human that has more intellect than another human, you would say that that person has more value because they have more intellect. That's simply not true. Or has, as has tragically been the case throughout history, some other attribute, like skin color or ethnic background, has been arbitrarily selected to confer value on some that humans over others. We can see the influence of the Christian worldview in the Declaration of Independence, which famously states, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To be clear, I'm not making any statements about America being a Christian nation or that the Founding Fathers were all Christians, nothing like that. I'm simply saying that their appeal to the equality of all people and their endowment with unalienable rights is due to the intrinsic value that we've been given from our Creator God. Many times during the American abolitionist movement, Abraham Lincoln appealed to these same self-evident truths that God has created all people as he pushed back against the evils of slavery. And Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., as he led in the civil rights movement, built his case for the equality of all people on the principle that we are made in the image of God. He said this, he said, The whole concept of the Imago Dei, as it's expressed in Latin, the image of God, is the idea that all men have something within them that God injected. Not that they have substantial unity with God, but that every man has a capacity to have fellowship with God. And this gives him a uniqueness. It gives him a worth. It gives him dignity. And we must never forget this as a nation. There are no gradations in the image of God. Every man from a treble white to a base black 
is significant on God's keyboard precisely because every man is made in the image of God. The doctrine that we are made in the image of God is as old as history. And whenever people have not held that principle, heartache and evil have always followed. And that's an immovable pillar that we must always keep in mind as we wrestle with these difficult issues regarding the value of life. And the message that, that God attributes great worth to mankind is a thread that we see all throughout the scriptures. Uh, John 3, 16, uh, the most famous verse in the Bible tells us that God loved us so much that he wanted so badly for our relationship with him to be restored that he sent his son Jesus to come and to, to suffer and die in our place. And so if the value of something is defined by how much someone's willing to give to it, then God could not have given us a more clear message of how much he loves people. In his famous Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells us that we shouldn't ever worry because after all, God cares for the sparrows. And he says, you are worth so much more than sparrows. You can trust me. I care about you. God has endowed each of us with great worth. So with that truth in place and with the sixth commandment, you shall not murder, familiar to many of us, I think it's safe to say that we know it's morally wrong to kill an innocent person because all humans were created in the image of God. And that's our basis for knowing that the racist and bigoted speech and actions are always in conflict with the heart of God. But things become more complicated when we begin to consider people who maybe aren't so innocent. So what about a situation of war where, where violent people are attacking innocent people? Or what about the death penalty? Is that appropriate to punish the most heinous of crimes? And what about the issue of abortion and the debate over when a human life actually begins? It's no secret that there's a wide variety of perspectives on these difficult topics. Well, before we dive into these, uh, I just want to acknowledge that for some of us, these topics remain on the level of philosophical discussion. We've never served in the military. We've never personally connected with someone who's, who's facing the death penalty. We've, we've never had an unplanned pregnancy or an abortion. We've never experienced the pain of a miscarriage. For those of us in, in that camp, as difficult as the questions are to answer, the exercise remains theoretical and somewhat at, at arm's length. But if there's also a large number of us, perhaps probably the majority of us, for whom these discussions are intensely personal. We carry hurt and scars and memories related to one of these questions. If that's you, I know that hearing people throw around biblical passages and talking about different perspectives and analyzing them can feel detached from your living reality. Realizing how emotionally charged these discussions can be, I might have asked you just give me grace as I try to present relevant scripture and provide tools for you and for each of us as we prayerfully consider how God would want us to, to approach and process these challenging topics. And our, our church leadership loves each person in our church, and we don't claim to have all the answers, but we do try to be faithful to present what we find in scripture, as well as what we learn from science and philosophy, and do to do that in as sensitively as a way as we can. And as a heads up, this is probably going to feel like a pretty academic approach. Uh, I'm not going to be telling a lot of stories or making an appeal to emotions. Now, these topics are already emotionally charged, and so my hope is to help us all appreciate the rational considerations when thinking about these issues, even though we probably are all feeling all sorts of different emotions as we go through this. Okay, so what insight does scripture give us on these very difficult topics? First up is war. And I think the one thing we all can agree on is that we sure wish that their war would be no more. And Jesus promises that one day there will be no more war. But that day will not come until Jesus fully takes his rightful place as king over all. And until that time, a Satan is active in our world. And the, the ace in his hand is that mankind is prone towards selfishness and pride and greed and hate. And Satan loves to play on those, which then leads to things like war. And there are some within Christians, uh, Christianity who are pacifists, who, who may acknowledge that war is inevitable, but believe that Jesus has instructed his followers to never participate in violence. And a representative passage uh, of scripture that is used to support this position is when Jesus said, you've heard that it is said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn them the other also. Those who adopt a pacifist position would say that this is a universal ban on violence for Christians. And it's easy to see why they would conclude that when you read this passage. 
However, the majority view of Christians throughout history um, has limited this command to refer to interpersonal uh, relationships and not to actions related to the formal governance of the state. And, and many Christians have arrived at this conclusion based upon passages like this from Paul's letter uh, to the Romans. It says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Here the Apostle Paul instructs Christians in Rome to obey their governing authorities, whom he says are established by God for their good, even though this Roman government was not a godly government. Regardless, Paul says that government is the construct of God intended to keep order and provide justice. And part of that role is bearing the sword, which is obviously an instrument of violence. There's other evidence that following Jesus doesn't preclude someone from being a soldier. Uh, one example is when Jesus interacted with a Roman soldier who asked him to heal uh, his servant. Jesus commended him and said that he had far greater faith than anyone he'd ever come across in Israel. And so in that moment, if Jesus had a fundamental issue with his role in society, one might assume he would have taken the opportunity to tell him. But scripture doesn't record that. So based on this evidence, the majority view of Christians over time has been that serving a government-sanctioned role as a member of the military is acceptable and even admirable for Christian because they're protecting innocent human life. But like I said, there are scriptural and philosophical case to be made for both sides in light of the value of the life of God's image bearers. Either you believe that God would call you uh, as a Christian to serve in the military in order to protect innocent human life, or you're convinced that God wouldn't call Christians into the military because he wouldn't ask us to take a precious human life under any condition. So another related topic is the death penalty or capital punishment. Uh, based on Dan Van Ness's book, A Call to Dialogue on Capital Punishment, uh, prisonfellowship.org provides three arguments that Christians have held over time uh, on this controversial issue. And so the first of the three arguments is that scripture mandates capital punishment. Uh, support for this argument includes Genesis 9, 6, which we read earlier, uh, which says that whoever sheds the blood of a man, by man shall his blood be shed. Now, this is read to say that the, the killing of an innocent human, it requires for justice that that person's life be taken. And since the, the law of Moses also dictates that a person should be killed if they murder someone, although it excludes a, an inadvertent killing, uh, and since the Apostle Paul told Christians in Rome, like we just heard, that, that the government bears a sword for a good reason, well, some Christians conclude that, well, Scripture mandates the death penalty be taken for intentional murder. But there are other Christians who take the exact opposite position. So argument two holds that Scripture prohibits capital punishment. Now, this position notes that Israel was a theocracy, a, a unique country that was governed by God. And when that theocratic state ceased to exist, then also these types of laws and types of practices also ceased to exist. Another approach for this argument is that Jesus' death on behalf of sinners eliminates the need for someone's blood to be shed in order to make up for murder because Jesus' blood has already been shed. This group also points out that Jesus' teaching emphasizes forgiveness and a willingness uh, to suffer rather than resist by evil. And so they say this type of teaching kind of pushes us away from something like capital punishment. And that leads to the third and final argument that Christians have taken over time, and that's that Scripture doesn't mandate, it doesn't prohibit, but Scripture permits capital punishment. And so this position acknowledges the points of arguments one and two, but rise somewhere in the middle. It holds that the appropriateness of capital's punishment um, that's expressed in Genesis 9 about taking a life if a life is taken. They say, yeah, that, that makes sense. But also points to examples of capital criminals that were not executed. People like Cain, like David, like Moses, which seem to provide room for not inflicting capital punishment, even when it could be justified. So as you can see, there's no clear consensus among Christians on this one. However, for those who believe that capital punishment is warranted, uh, in some cases, well, Scripture dictates that it must be arrived at under specific conditions, uh, such as there's a due process, there's certainty of guilt, and that the offense was intentional. Again, the inherent value of human life is central to any of these conclusions, whether ensuring that appropriate repercussions for murder reflect the value of the innocent victim, or 
to respect the intrinsic value of the life of the guilty party. Either way, that principle is held up. Well, the final issue to cover related to the value of life is abortion. A statistics tell us that nearly one in four women will have an abortion at some point in their life. And so most of us have either experienced an abortion personally or in close relationship with someone who has. And as we broach this deeply personal and sensitive topic, let me say up front that we're not going to land on a cut and dry answer. There are some things that our church leadership believes we all need to consider on this issue, specifically if you're a follower of Jesus. But we don't believe there's an explicit and direct addressing of abortion in Scripture. That said, there is relevant biblical, scientific, and philosophical evidence for us to look at, particularly around when the unborn are full humans that possess the image of God. As we've discussed throughout this talk, a core Christian belief is that the life of God's image bearers has immense value. And so it's incumbent upon Christians to determine when an embryo or a fetus or a baby reaches that point. So that's a question that we need to answer. When exactly does a new life become an image bearer of God? First, let's look to scripture. And as I've said, the Bible doesn't explicitly give us that answer. There are some passages that have been used to indicate that God sees us as a person while we are still in the womb. The most famous of those passages is found in Psalm 139. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. This is obviously not an excerpt from a medical journal. It's a song that is marveling at how completely God knows us. It's, it's poetic. It's not scientific. But it seems to indicate that unborn babies are on God's mind and that the psalmist David sees himself as a person while in the womb. He says that his frame was not hidden from God. An inter- another interesting passage is uh, Luke chapter 1, verses 39 to 45, which describes Mary, who was in the very early stages of pregnancy with Jesus. She wouldn't have even know that she was pregnant, except an angel came and told her. Well, she goes to see her relative, Elizabeth, who was about six months pregnant at the time with John the Baptist. We read this. It says, When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is a child you will bear. So John the Baptist, in Elizabeth's womb, responded strongly when Mary, who had Jesus inside of her for only a couple weeks, um, she came near. Again, we have to be careful about making sweeping assumptions. We're talking about how a highly important prophet interacts with the Son of God in utero. This is a very specific and unique situation. Um, But as we do our best to try and infer what we can from Scripture, this could be seen as support that a fetus contains personhood from an early stage. So on the question of when exactly a newly formed life becomes an image bearer of God, the Bible doesn't seem to provide a cut and dry answer. There are some suppositions that we could draw based on these and other passages, but they're limited since there are potential secondary takeaways from portions of Scripture making a different primary point. And although scientific knowledge of reproduction was close to non-existent in biblical times, today we have actually a vast amount of knowledge on these things. And so it would be irresponsible to reach a conclusion on such an important topic without taking the medical community's input into account. And as it ends up, the medical community has known for a number of years that a human life begins at conception. In 1981, a U.S. Senate Judiciary Subcommittee heard expert testimony on when a human life begins. After hearing all the testimonies, a report was produced uh, that issued the following conclusion. Physicians, biologists, and other scientists agree that conception marks the beginning of the life of a human being, a being that is alive and is a member of the human species. There's overwhelming agreement on this point in countless medical, biological, and scientific writings. So scientists have reached a consensus on the question of when human life begins. It begins at conception. This is obviously an important finding that lends support to the idea that we become image bearers at the moment of conception. But the biblical concept of being an image bearer doesn't necessarily have a direct corollary in medical language. And there's arisen a new pairing of terms within this debate that in many ways has become the focus now that the start of human life has been clearly defined. And those terms are human being versus human person. Now, if that seems confusing to you, it's because it is. Uh, The start of a living human being is a medical determination that has been established as at conception. 
But the idea of personhood is a philosophical construct, and there's no general consensus on when that begins. There's two general schools of thought on this new, new concept of personhood. The first is that a human being is a human person. They're one and the same. You can't be a human being without being a human person. Like, that's impossible. So that's one school of thought. The other school of thought is that personhood is not achieved immediately upon creation of a new human life, but some benchmark of development must first be achieved. The proposed potential required benchmarks for personhood include implantation, certain stages of development within the womb, birth, or in some cases, people propose that personhood isn't obtained until some point after a baby is born. Examples of in utero indicators have been proposed are things like brain activity, a heartbeat, the ability to feel sensation. But again, the distinction between a human being and a human person is philosophical, if a distinction actually exists at all. And this is at the heart of the abortion debate today, and, and really is at the heart of the related legal debate, because laws are often written around the rights of human persons or citizens. But we can't agree when a human being becomes a human person or citizen, we can't know when that human being receives those rights. Well, it sure would make things easier if the Bible provided clarity on this particular point, but it doesn't. The easiest and clearest way to resolve the tension would be to say that personhood begins when a new human is formed. But easiest doesn't intrinsically make it correct. And since the concept of personhood, apart from being a human being, isn't determined by hard science, it's a philosophical construct, this debate is going to continue for quite some time. That said, as you wade through all of this and consider where you should land, let me share the philosophical background for those who consider personhood to begin at conception. And you can use this to help evaluate whether this perspective is compelling to you. So a guy named Scott Klusendorf uses the acronym SLED to make the case for human beings intrinsically having personhood. So SLED stands for size, level of development, environment, and dependency. We'll start with size. Scott argues that some people struggle to consider an embryo a person because of its size, because it's so small. But he says that doesn't make sense. I mean, Joel Embiid is much larger than any of us, but that doesn't make him more of a person than we are. So size as a barrier to personhood is illogical because being larger doesn't make us more of a person. The second mental obstacle people can have is level of development. Since a four-week-old that's an embryo still has a great deal of development to take place before it's ready to be born, some may feel hesitant to see it as a person. However, Scott makes the point that a two-year-old is not fully developed sexually. We don't say that two-year-old is less of a, of a person than a 25-year-old. So picking any developmental milestone to serve as a starting point of personhood is necessarily arbitrary, and therefore it's indefensible. A third argument that people have is the baby's environment. If a baby still exists inside of its mother, uh, then maybe it can't have personhood. Scott argues that where you are has no bearing on what you are. So he finds it unreasonable to assert that an eight inch journey down the birth canal can change the essential nature of the unborn. And the final philosophical consideration he addresses is dependency. Some argue that since an unborn baby is dependent upon its mother, it should not be considered a unique person. But that thinking wouldn't hold up for conjoined twins. When we have conjoined twins, we don't say that one or both of them aren't unique persons. And also, if someone's on life support for a while, we don't say they stop being human over the time of dependency. So to be consistent, Scott would say that dependency is not a factor in determining personhood. All right, we have covered a ton of ground. And along the way, uh, we've considered relevant scripture, historical Christian perspectives, and pertinent scientific information for all these topics that we've covered, all while keeping in front of you the premise that for followers of Jesus, we need to remember the intrinsic value of all people as image bearers. That needs to be at the center of our discussion. So that's a clear biblical principle we all can stand on as each of us humbly reflect and pray for God's clarity on these complicated topics. You know, I also want to acknowledge that we haven't presented the issue of women's rights at all in the discussion on abortion. And, and many people say, like, hey, that's at least half of the, the argument. The reason is that women's rights isn't the aspect of this complicated, multifaceted topic that this message is focused on. We're focusing on the implications of people being God's image bearers on war, the death penalty, and abortion. Our church supports women and women's rights. So not talking about them today doesn't mean that we don't think that they're important. There are also other important related issues that the church should be invested in, like poverty, 
and adoption, um, foster care, support for single mothers, which are areas that we've been raising awareness on and providing support for to our community outreach partners throughout This Is Love this past month. And so um, we recognize that what we've talked about today is, is just one aspect of the issue. But the question we've tried to answer today, it kind of stands outside all of that. For Christians, when it comes to the issue of abortion, the first thing we need to reconcile is when a fertilized egg becomes an image bearer of God, because that's when scripture becomes very clear about our obligation to it. If or when an embryo is not an image bearer, then there's a very different conversation to be had that honestly, I don't know that scripture has much to say about. That becomes more of a political discussion. And with my pastor hat on, I'll take a pass on that. But given the gravity of what scripture says about how we treat image bearers, we want to make sure that our church is aware and in tune with the latest science and the debate that currently evolves around personhood. It is not an easy topic, but it's far too important for us to be uninformed about. You know, we can't just fall in line with whatever our political party affiliation is because no political party is looking at this issue with the primary goal of being faithful to scripture. And so as far as Jesus, we have a personal responsibility to seek God for ourselves on this topic because ultimately he's our authority. And finally, I just want to acknowledge again that this is an intensely personal and potentially painful topic for many people. And, and our choosing to have this conversation is not meant to bring guilt or shame or anything like that on anybody. If you're a military person who struggles with what you've done or what you've experienced or you've experienced an abortion or trying to process all of this and you could use someone to support you, uh, please reach out to your location pastor or, or someone else within the church or, or anybody at all. Man, we, we want to pray with you. We want to listen to you. We want to help you find resources. They'd be helpful to you. You matter to God and you matter to us. And if you do have regrets, man, we would remind you of the grace and love of Jesus. Through him, you can know forgiveness and freedom from anything in our past, no matter what it is. God's love and his mercy are that big. Well, if you need it, go ahead and take a deep breath. Because we have officially made it through all four weeks of our Tough Talk series. Thank you so much for hanging in there and being willing to think about and wrestle with some topics that really are difficult to process and get our arms around. They're complicated, they're multifaceted, they're emotionally charged. And I know at least for me, four 30-ish minute talks uh, don't resolve all the tension. So as we have conversations and process all this in the days to come, let's listen to understand Let's share our stories. Let's really care for each other. And as you know, it's not like we've covered all the complicated issues that are out there. And so there will be tough talks in the future. But I'm grateful to be a part of a church that isn't scared to ask the hard questions, to prayerfully study scripture, to find answers. And that's a place where we can love and respect each other as beloved image bearers of God, even when our humble pursuit of truth might lead us to different conclusions. So with that in mind, let me go ahead and pray for us. Father, Lord, I just thank you uh, for a community of people where we can seek truth, we can seek understanding in the light of what you revealed to us, God, that we can have discussions, that we can hear each other's perspectives, learn about each other's experiences, and, and wrestle with these, these questions that aren't so cut and dry as we wish they were. Father, I want to pray for each person as they process this, God, that um, that you just give them wisdom to think things through, that you give them clarity of thought. God, I pray against any guilt and any shame, anything that would make people um, shrink back from you or shrink back from these things, Lord. I pray that for those for whom this has been very difficult to think about and it's brought up memories, God, I pray that you would um, be a comfort to them. God, no matter where we're at with all these topics, God, we trust that you are with us, that you love us, Lord, that you give us grace every day. And Lord, as we, as we try to process these things and try to understand your mind on them, God, just give us the help that we need to do that and the peace to know, Lord, that you're with us through it. So God, thank you. We love you. Help us to be people who are always full of, of grace, who are full of love, and who have a desire for your truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Again. Uh, thanks so much for being a part of this series and I look forward to the Q&A session we'll have coming up here and getting back to you on your questions. I know that me and the other pastors will be 
glad to do that. And man, let's just keep getting better together and follow Jesus. Thanks so much, Jake, for that message. And thanks to all of you for being here. If you have any questions that were stirred up today or in the past few weeks as a part of the series, that's a good thing. Church should be a place where we have questions and a place where we can seek guidance in those questions. So feel free to send those questions that you've had about the topics in this series through the hub. You can text in to access the hub through the information right on the screen. And be sure to join us this Wednesday, August 28th. We'll be hosting our Tough Talks Q&A at 7 p.m. at our Epic Roxborough location, where some of our pastors will be responding to those questions that you have throughout the series. So we can continue the conversation. We hope to see you guys there. Well, thanks so much for being here today. I hope to see all of you right back here next week.